Okay, we are. Uh, so that's what we're going to cover. We're going to cover um, impact of a prison sentence on uh, the residence requirements. Uh, there's going to be an overuse suitability requirements, how to make a late application, and what's needed in relation to a disclosure of criminal records. Uh, referral to immigration enforcement, pending prosecutions, and then um, decisions on um, suitability grounds. So lots of people will be familiar with uh, what the EU Settled Status Scheme is. Um, obviously, uh, enables uh, EA citizens and family members um, to remain uh, and live lawfully in the UK. Uh, after Brexit, the main deadline for applications was people probably be aware as well, 30th of June. Uh, 2021 with some exceptions which um, I'm not going to deal with here but there are various exceptions like joining family members, uh, surrender sin applications etc and it's obviously possible to submit a late application to the scheme uh, where a person has reasonable grounds uh, for uh, doing so and I'll be dealing with uh, the reasonable grounds for making a late application a bit later on uh, and importantly uh, eligibility is governed by uh, appendix EU uh, to the immigration rules. So whenever you're looking at the EU settlement scheme, that's your go-to document, really. So who has to apply? Basically, uh, every EU national family member has to apply to remain lawfully in the UK, um, save for very limited exceptions. Irish citizens have a separate right to reside in the UK. Uh, they can, but they don't have to make an EU settlement scheme application. Uh, importantly, though, Irish family members do need to apply through the scheme, though. So it only applies to Irish citizens, not their family members, in relation to uh, whether or not um, they have a discretion as to applying the scheme. Uh, the same with people with indefinite leave to remain. Uh, they can, but they don't need to apply. Uh, there may be perfectly good reasons for them to apply under the settlement scheme. Uh, it obviously is a newer immigration status. Uh, and uh, it also has various benefits, including uh, better family reunification rights, uh, and also indefinitely to remain can't be lost by two years absence from the UK. Uh, sorry, uh, indefinitely to remain can be lost by two years absence from the UK, whereas uh, settled status can only be lost after five years. Uh, the criteria for um, applicants is uh, obviously production of evidence of identity and nationality, uh, continuous and qualifying period of residence in a relevant category, and importantly for our purposes, passing the suitability test. So the relevant categories are set out there. Uh, they include obviously EA citizens, family members, uh, people with der derivative or Zambrano right to reside. Uh, Zambrano right to reside for those uh, people who are unfamiliar um, are third country nationals uh, with a uh, British child. Um, derivative rights include um, Chen carers, so um, non-EU nationals with um, uh, EEA children, uh, and Ibrahim and Tashira um, derivative rights, um, where uh, somebody's a primary carer of an EU national in um, education. And it also includes family members of uh, qualifying or naturalised British citizens, including those people with retained rights. Uh, continuous qualifying period, what that means is uh, the person's residence has to have begun uh, before 11pm uh, on the 31st of December 2020. Again, except for joining family members um, who can join despite not being resident at that period of time. Um, to be allowed to continue as qualifying period, um, can't be absent uh, for more than six months in any 12 months uh, during a, a rolling 12 month period. So importantly, it's not a calendar year. Um, if somebody, for instance, left on the 23rd of March, um, the 12 months would, uh, on 23rd of March 2021, the um, period of time of 12 months would last till the 23rd of March 2022. And that's when you have to look at whether or not they've been absent for more than six months during that period of time. There are various exceptions to that. Um, they include uh, things uh, we should describe as an important reason, yeah. pregnancy, serious illness, et cetera, compulsory military service. Uh, also recently there have been um, uh, some additional exceptions uh, where the reason for the absence is COVID and there is an air centre information sheet which uh, is available on that link and on the air centre website where you can um, find out uh, on the basis upon which people who have been absent because of COVID uh, are still able to uh, maintain their continuous qualifying period even though they may have been absent indeed for more than 12 months. Um, and then there are various other matters uh, including um, 
uh, having served a prison sentence of any length in the UK, and we will talk a little bit about that uh, shortly. Um, so, uh, as an overview, uh, the conditions are for settled status that you have five years of residence, um, doesn't have to be uh, uh, a qualifying right in the sense of under the old uh, Citizens' Rights Directive and EA regs, um, you have to be a worker or someone who's self-employed, etc. Uh, it's purely periods of residence. So you don't actually need to be doing anything in the UK to qualify. And then uh, the additional one is that there's been no supervening event uh, which has occurred since the completion of the five-year period of residence. So uh, the Home Office defines a supervening event uh, in Appendix U as uh, either a period of absence from the UK of more than five years uh, or four years if you're a Swiss citizen since they last acquired the right of permanent residence in the UK. Uh, and the applicant, or the applicant has been issued with an exclusion deportation order um, other than under the EEA regs and, and or the applicant has been issued with a decision to exclude or remove him under the EEA regs. So essentially, if you've been absent for more than five years, uh, or you've been issued with an exclusion deportation order either uh, under the EEA regs or under domestic immigration law, then that will be deemed to be a supervening event for the purposes of um, your settled status. Eligibility for pre-settled status, uh, essentially anything less than five years, so anything from one day to four years and 11 months. Um, What is the impact of a prison sentence um, after five years of residence? So the basic rule is that a continuous qualifying period is going to be broken where the person served or is serving a sentence of imprisonment of any length of time, uh, even one day in the UK or in the various islands such as the um, such as Guernsey or Jersey, Jersey, etc. The exception is that if a prisoner prior to their criminal sentence had already acquired permanent residence, um, so it for instance, had had five years um, uh, of working or self-employed or a mixture of the two, or as a student with comprehensive sickness insurance, or as a uh, family member of somebody who was um, working, etc. And under the 2016 um, EA regs, they should in principle be granted settled status under the scheme, as long as I say there's no supervening event which has occurred since they last acquired PR. However, uh, if an EU, EA or Swiss citizen or their family member who's been resident in the UK for less than five years breaks their continuity qualifying period after 11 p.m. on the 31st of December 2020, this potentially has one of two consequences for them. So if, for instance, they've secured pre settled status, as a reminder, limitedly to remain free of the USS, they won't be able to upgrade to settled status indefinitely to remain, as pre settled status can't be renewed or extended. So the interruption will leave the person short of the five years they need to qualify with no way of making up the time. If they haven't applied for the USS at all, and reminder that the USS um, scheme closed on the 30th of June, uh, they won't be able to do so now. So joining family members. So where a person's continuity of residence has been broken by a sentence of imprisonment, and they were then released from prison after the 31st of December 2020, it may still be possible for them to apply to the EUSS as a joining family member. So that is the way in which um, they might still be able to apply to the EUSS. Uh, importantly, this only applies to close family members. So they're listed there. It doesn't include um, siblings, um, uh, more uh, remote relatives like uncles, aunts, etc. And where the EA national relative was resident in the UK on or before the 31st December 2020, uh, they would have had to have obtained settled or pre-settled status under the USS. And again, there is a link um, to the uh, S-Centre information sheet on joining family members, uh, which again can be accessed via the website. So moving on to suitability requirements. So an overview of the suitability requirements, that's where the um, Appendix EU contains the rules which set out the grounds on which an application could be rejected on suitability grounds. There are mandatory grounds for refusal. So, sorry, I'm clicking something else. The applications will be refused. So it's a mandatory ground of refusal. Uh, if at the date of the application, 
uh, the applicant was subject to a deportation order, a decision to make a deportation order, an exclusion order, or an exclusion decision. Uh, there's no real guidance in relation to this, but uh, we have contacted the um, USS grants team um, and sought some clarification on it. Uh, the policy team essentially will say that um, where there is a deportation order or a decision to make a deportation order, um, Appendix EU15 allows them to refuse an application. However, um, we have certainly had cases where um, somebody has appealed against a decision, so they've appealed against their deportation or exclusion or removal, um, and their application has been paused. So um, where there is an ongoing appeal, um, so you can show that somebody has appealed against their deportation or removal, uh, we would recommend uploading evidence of the appeal, so a confirmation, for instance, from the first hit tribunal that they've received the appeal, any directions from the court, etc., and then request that decisions not be made until the outcome of the appeal is known. And one of the reasons for doing that is obviously if somebody, for instance, has um, put in an application before the 30th of June 2021, um, what you don't want them to, to happen is for it to be refused and you then have to do um, either a, a late application or um, an admin review, et cetera. It's much easier if you can show, well, um, uh, we appealed on, we, we submitted our application on time. Um, there was a deportation order. Persons appealed against that um, deportation order. And now what should happen is that um, their application should simply be stayed uh, pending a decision about the outcome um, of the deportation appeal. Um, so in terms of uh, conduct committed after um, the 31st of uh, December 2020. Um, so uh, this is usually criminal conduct, but it could be um, other conduct which um, is deemed to be uh, in the uh, EU 15-2's words, not conducive to the public good. Uh, then um, applications again will be refused on the grounds of suitability where that test is met. Uh, there's definition of what's non-conducive to the public goods. Uh, good. It means that it's undesirable to allow a person to remain in the UK or admit a person to the UK based on their character, conduct or associations because they pose a threat to the UK society. It's an intentionally broad test, so it's not limited to criminal convictions uh, and it can relate to behaviour falling short of a conviction. Um, it applies to behaviour in both the UK and overseas. Uh, the test has to be applied on a case-by-case -case basis uh, and all refusals uh, on this basis have to be reasonable, proportionate and evidence-based. So there is an opportunity in relation to a uh, refusal on suitability in these, in these cases to make representations to why it's disproportionate uh, in the circumstances of the particular case uh, to refuse on the grounds of suitability uh, where conduct's been um, committed after the 31st of December 2020. And then there are a number of discretionary grounds of uh, refusal. Um, so they are all set out in um, EU 16. So EU 16A um, says that uh, where somebody includes false or misleading uh, information um, submitted to um, uh, any person to obtain a document used in support of the application, uh, and all the information, representational documentation is material to the decision whether or not to grant the applicant settled or pre-settled status, uh, then they can be a discretionary grounds for refusal. So the misrepresentation has to relate, obviously, uh, and be material to the decision around um, the settled or pre-settled status. Um, so an example of that would, for instance, be providing false documents or falsely claiming five years residence or falsely claiming a family relationship, etc. EU16B, um, this is, for example, where an applicant is seeking to the UK following um, an administrative removal. Um, so, for instance, they haven't been exercising treaty rights or they're subject to some sort of immigration offence, such as uh, a marriage convenience. Um, and they can't provide evidence that immediately upon re-entry they would be a qualified person. 
So if the applicant has already been considered for removal, uh, that consideration has to be completed before any decision is made on their application under the EU Turkey Labour Scheme. And a person won't meet the threshold for removal solely because, for instance, they're a student or a self-sufficient person who doesn't hold consequences of this insurance. EU 16C um, relates to someone who's previously been refused under Regulation 23 of the 2016 regulation. So uh, they've been refused due to conduct committed prior to the 31st December 2020. Um, has to be justified on the grounds of public policy, security or health uh, in accordance with Regulation 27 of the 2016 regulations. Uh, and again, refusal due to conduct after the 31st December 2020 has to be justified on the grounds that it can that the decision is conducive to public good. EU 16 D and E, uh, these include persons where it's been decided to exclude them from the refugee convention or for humanitarian protection. So applicants refused EUSS but who cannot be deported due to human rights reason can be considered for a grant of restricted leave outside of the immigration rules. If you know with suitability and conduct committed prior to 11 p.m. on the 31st of 2020, um, so in respect of this, uh, the sequence would essentially be that there will be a criminal record check uh, following the submission of the application. There will be a referral to immigration enforcement, consideration of whether or not um, conduct merits deportation. Uh, and there will be an issuing of a deport decision and a refusing of the USS application on the basis of that decision. But because of the definition of deport decision in Appendix EU, this consideration at stage two must be in line with and meet the test set out in Regulation 27. So that, as a reminder, it has to be on the grounds of public policy, health, etc. And a refusal couldn't be issued on the basis of a deport decision which did not meet that test. If the applicant is not a relevant excluded person, so um, uh, is um, not subject to the Refugee Convention, Humanitarian Protection, doesn't fall within paragraph um, 16C1, so previous refusal of admission to the UK, etc. Then the conduct committed before the specified date, 31st December 2020, will only be a basis for refusal if it results in a deportation order decision. Uh, and then um, there's just some considerations as to um, what the Home Office will take into account when looking at uh, conduct committed prior to 11 p.m. Um, on the 31st of December. Um, so importantly, um, it includes the proportionality reasons like somebody's age, their state of health, family economic situation, their length of residence, their integration in the UK, uh, and the extent, vice versa, of their links with um, their country of origin. And there's a listed schedule one of the 2016 regulations about what the decision, default decision maker has to take into account uh, when considering whether or not um, this conduct meets the test. Um, so uh, that's just a summary really. Um, as a result, all criminal conduct committed prior to 11 p.m. on 31st December has to be considered under Regulation 27. Uh, and a refusal on the basis of conduct prior to this time shouldn't be made unless justified again on the grounds of public policy, security or health. Uh, EU 17, um, so uh, this relates um, to uh, the fact um, that uh, an application shouldn't be refused uh, where at the date of the decision, um, the deportation order or exclusion order has been set aside. Um, so that could be either through a first tier tribunal decision confirming that the orders um, that the appeal against deportation has been allowed. It could be where the Home Office have decided no longer to pursue deportation as a result of submissions made uh, during the proceedings. Um, it could be that um, the Home Office, having issued a deport order, um, then revoke that deport order during um, due to a change of circumstances. So the S Centre has had several cases where. Um, somebody has been subject to a deport order, that deport order has not been um, made to good effect, the person has remained in the UK, uh, their circumstances have changed, for instance, we've had cases where somebody may have had a British child uh, with their partner, um, where um, they've, for instance, um, had treatment for a particular uh, illness, physical or mental health, 
um, where they um, their family circumstances may have changed, they may have had a caring role um, for an elderly relative, etc. Um, all of those are potentially changes of circumstance, which means say that the Home Office should reconsider um, their previous decision to um, uh, seek somebody's deportation. Disability and children. Um, so basically children under the age of 18 are exempt from declaring criminal convictions in their EUSS application, so that they're, they're not required to self-disclose uh, their criminal convictions. Um, but any applicant over the age of 10 will still be subject to a criminal record check um, against the police national computer, uh, which is the UK database, or the warnings index, which is the overseas database containing uh, people's convictions. Um, uh, abroad. Um, any refusal of status to children on the grounds of conduct uh, has to be and uh, must be absolutely uh, exceptional. It has to be based on imperative grounds of public security alone, so it can't be on the grounds of public policy or health, and it has to take account of the best interests of the child. Um, and where the best interest of the child test was set out is Section 55 of the Border Citizenship and Immigration Act 2000. This is a mandatory duty on the Home Office and others making immigration decisions, basically to safeguard and promote the welfare of children in the UK as they carry out their functions. And the scope of the duty is quite broad. It means that almost any immigration decision taken within the UK should include a consideration of this duty and a failure to do so may make that decision unlawful and appealable to an immigration tribunal. Um, so in the case where a child is a principal offender has committed a serious offence and might meet that imperative grounds of public security, it would help and may help submit legal representations explaining why this should not affect his or her application. Um, prison sentences will affect continuity of residence for children in the same way. So um, children's continuity of residence can be broken by a prison sentence. Uh, just moving on to making an application uh, and deadlines. Um, uh, we've reiterated this. Um, the deadline was 30th of June uh, 2021. Um, anybody who's not applied, who doesn't fall within one of the exceptions, such as joining family a member, etc., now has to make a late application uh, which show reasonable grounds uh, for their failure to meet the deadline. Uh, there's the link to Home Office work, case working guidance, which provides examples of what constitutes reasonable grounds for a late application. Um, obviously, it's by a case by case basis, and uh, what constitutes reasonable grounds um, uh, is not specifically defined within the guidance system. So, so the fact that you might have a reason which isn't within the guidance doesn't mean to say that you can't um, argue that that would be a reasonable grounds for failing to meet the, the deadline. So the guidance isn't exhaustive uh, and every case has to be considered in light of its particular circumstances. Um, unsurprisingly, um, uh, and I'll come on to uh, this, certain things obviously fall within um, uh, reasonable grounds. So for instance, somebody who has mental capacity or mental health issues uh, or physical disability or um, who's subject to trafficking or a controlling or a abusive, coercive relationship, um, or who's homeless uh, and who may not have um, been aware or able to access the documentation, um, somebody who uh, hasn't been able to um, make an application because of, of, of technical issues, um, so they haven't had access to the internet, etc. cetera. Um, all of these reasons could, um, could fall within uh, um, are reasonable grounds. For our purposes in relation to criminality, the Home Office Guidance also provides a reasonable grounds include where a person was released from prison uh, after the deadline applicable to them um, in the scheme. So essentially, um, they've been in prison um, serving their prison sentence. They're only released post 30th of June uh, 2021. Uh, that would be a reasonable grounds, obviously, for um, applying. Um, and the guidance provides that it would normally be the case that there's a presumption in those cases um, that it, uh, an application will be accepted late, where, for instance, they haven't had ready access to immigration advice. They obviously haven't been able to access important documents. So, for instance, their ID cards or passports um, and or where they're awaiting a decision on whether or not um, they were going to be deported. Um, so all of 
whether those will constitute reasonable grounds for the purposes of somebody um, who is serving a sentence and or um, uh, has been convicted of an offence. Um, and there's a list of essentially of, of, of documentation, which is very um, uh, uh, self-explanatory, really. Um, so they'd obviously provide um, details about um, their prison sentence release date to show that, for instance, they uh, were not released um, post 30, well, they were not released before the 30th of June 2020. One and all that their uh, release was very close to that deadline and therefore it wasn't reasonably applicable for them to be able to get their application in time. Uh, a kind of letter explaining the difficulties they faced around IT, access information, and then any evidence that they can get from prison um, in relation to um, the difficulties that um, uh, prisons face in relation to making an application. Uh, I mean, in our general experience, foreign national managers tend to be quite supportive um, of um, foreign national prisoners in relation to their settled status scheme um, and assisting them with letters just confirming that, um, uh, for instance, you know, their, you know, their passport was located elsewhere or had been lost, et cetera. Um, so it's always worthwhile um, trying to contact the uh, prison where they last were um, to get that kind of information. Closure of criminal records. So um, people are only uh, required to declare past criminal convictions that appear in their criminal record. Uh, and importantly, um, criminal record in accordance with the law of the state of conviction at the time of the application. So um, uh, there are instances where um, a particular offence uh, may be an offence in the UK, but it's not an offence. Um, in relation to Italy, for instance. I mean, it's a bit few and far between, but there are certain circumstances um, where um, what might have been an offence in the UK wouldn't be, in, wouldn't be regarded as an offence in Italy and vice versa. Um, it also includes an obligation to declare whether or not they've been involved in any terrorist-related activities, war crimes, crimes against America, genocide, etc. cetera. Um, but uh, I've certainly never seen uh, anybody applying that or noted anybody applying for this sub-status scheme who's um, uh, is self-declared that they've been involved um, with uh, genocide, but who knows. Uh, importantly, uh, caseworkers can, where appropriate, consider evidence of criminality that they encounter on the police national computer or the warnings index, even if that evidence was not declared by the applicant. A motion to conduct overseas um, if the applicant declares previous overseas criminality or the PNC or um, W warnings index indicates that they were previously extradited from the UK um, or were subject to a European arrest warrant or had uh, an overseas conviction, um, then um, further inquiries um, could be made in respect of those. Um, and certainly um, uh, we have the Air Centre successfully argued that, for instance, where there is an outstanding European arrest warrant, that uh, an application in relation to um, central state scheme should be stayed pending uh, the determination of that European arrest warrant um, rather than being refused. Um, and or that where the European arrest warrant may, for instance, relate to what appears to be quite a minor offence, that actually, even if the European arrest warrant uh, was triggered, um, that that should not of itself um, mean that the application would be refused on the basis that um, it wouldn't meet the test um, for deportation, public policy, et cetera. Uh, that's just going back to EU 16, which is that obviously applicants have to respond honestly to questions about their criminal record. Um, and there's no requirement to declare spent offences, cautions, or alternatives to prosecution. So, for instance, fixed penalty and obviously don't need to be um, disclosed. In relation to spent offences in the UK, um, they're dealt with under the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act. Uh, a very useful site is um, the site on Unlock, um, uh, which um, supports prisoners in relation to employment, uh, et cetera. Uh, and they have a very useful um, template to explain um, when particular sentences will be spent 
uh, and when they're not. Um, so it's uh, where you have somebody who um, served a two or three years prison sentence some time ago, it's certainly worthwhile just double checking as to whether or not that um, offence is spent for the purposes of the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act. Um, it's obviously trickier where the um, conviction was overseas um, because obviously uh, they will have different rules around when convictions are spent, if at all. Um, uh, I mean, there are obviously um, uh, lawyers uh, in the UK who will be aware of, for instance, you know, Spanish law around uh, when convictions are spent, but uh, it's certainly trickier in relation to then ascertaining whether or not um, a conviction should be um, uh, disclosed. Uh, and the basic rule is if you're unsure, um, the client should be told um, that they should um, disclose their criminal convictions because obviously if they are um, uh, found to have been dishonest about that, um, that will cause their application a great deal of problems. Um, I don't know, for some reason the slides are stuck. Just gonna stop sharing and start them again. Great. Um, so, uh, Unsurprisingly, applicants often won't be able to remember um, uh, the full extent of their criminal records. Um, if there is an issue about whether or not they are able to remember, it will often be helpful um, to uh, ask that their application be paused whilst you make an application for disclosure um, of their um, PNC. Um, and obviously, uh, you can make a, a subject answer just request the Criminal Records Office for a copy of the uh, PNC, um, uh, which will be which will uh, be helpful in obviously identifying um, what criminal convictions um, were in play. Uh, and to do that, you just have to provide uh, the applicants provide proof of their ID, address, history, uh, and a request can be submitted online with valid email. Um, and it doesn't take very long um, for results to come back. It should be provided within uh, one month. So referral to immigration enforcement, uh, when does that take place? So uh, it will take place from information either provided by the applicant or from information obtained from the police national computer database or the warnings index. So basically UK visas of immigration must determine whether or not uh, the applicant application has to be referred to immigration enforcement uh, for a full consideration of the individual's contact. So if the application is referred, then the applicant will, where relevant, be contacted, invited to submit representations as to why they shouldn't be deported or excluded. Where the relevant test for deportation or exclusion is met, the Home Office they will then inform the applicant of the deportation decision and will issue a separate letter refusing the applicant's application under the EU assess based on that decision. Where the relevant test for deportation or exclusion isn't met, then the applicant should be granted um, status under the EUSS, where the requirements of part one of the appendix EU to the immigration rules are met. Um, so for instance, you know, they're an international acceptor and they will be notified of that decision. Where a deportation decision is made, um, and it may not be the case that all citizens pre-transition period, um, all citizens pre-transition period conduct is assessed under the conditions of the Free Movement Directive. So basically, um, uh, the transition period is uh, dated as a reminder of 31st December 2020, um, where um, conduct was committed, um, which has then led to immigration uh, enforcement and a deportation decision. Uh, what had been assumed was that um, uh, the decision then as to whether or not somebody should be deported would uh, essentially fall to be decided under uh, the Citizens' Rights Directive, so the Free Movement Directive, um, and the uh, 2016 
uh, regs. But uh, the application deadline and temporary protection regulations mean to say that um, uh, EU law protections essentially uh, only apply to those who uh, can show that they were resident in the UK on, on the 31st of December 2020 and that they met the conditions of the EEA regs of 2016. So um, essentially that they were uh, exercising a lawful right to reside. So that means that for um, someone who's released from prison before the end of the transition period, who doesn't receive uh, a deportation decision until um, the 1st of January 2021 onwards, um, that deport deportation decision doesn't have to be issued uh, under the uh, 2016 uh, EA regs if they were not a qualified person on the 31st of December 2020. So, um, uh, when you begin to work on these cases or when you see these cases, um, sometimes the Home Office will accept somebody was lawfully resident uh, and were therefore a qualified person on the 31st of December and therefore the deportation decision is issued under the regs and under EU law. Um, however, increasingly, um, the Home Office will seek to argue that um, the deportation decision is issued under the much harsher UK uh, domestic immigration um, laws and that um, the applicant is not entitled to the protections um, that they were once afforded under EU law uh, and as supplemented and implemented by the 2016 EA regs. Um, so as an example, uh, this could apply to someone who's got, who's had a five-year residence period before imprisonment, um, that was not under the EA regs, so a worker self-sufficient about Compensation assurance, for instance, if their sentence is completed after the 31st December, then they wouldn't be covered by the application deadline and temporary protection regulations. So again, it seems that a deportation decision um, would not, in those circumstances, need to be based on the EA regs or the Citizens Rights Directive. Even for people protected by the application deadline and temporary protection regulations on the basis that they do meet the conditions of the EA regs, as of 31st September 2020, if they don't then make an EUSS application before the 30th of June 2021 deadline, then they also fall outside of these regs. So there would be an, so basically somebody who can't show that they're lawfully, um, they were lawfully resident as of 31st December 2020, for whatever reason, i.e. because their prison sentence um, uh, has now taken them over the 30th of June deadline and they haven't applied. If they haven't made an EU assets application for that deadline, then um, they fall outside of uh, the EA regs and will be dealt with under domestic um, uh, immigration law. Um, there are potentially arguments about um, there being an overriding requirement under the withdrawal agreement to provide this protection, um, but uh, regulation two of the restrictions of rights of entry and residence regulations doesn't seem to include them. And if that's right, it means that they would need to be able to raise a direct um, withdrawal agreement ground of appeal in a deportation uh, appeal. And at the moment, it seems to me that the ability to raise uh, a withdrawal agreement as a ground of appeal um, is provided in the Immigration Citizens Rights Appeals Regulations 2020. But again, those regs don't seem to extend to deportation where the appellant doesn't have an EUSF status in the first place. Um, so things are very difficult. Brilliant. Um, so, yeah. So there's several scenarios where they uh, have to refer, where the Home Office have to refer to uh, immigration enforcement. So where the applicants in the last five years received a conviction which resulted in their imprisonment, uh, where the applicant had at any time received a conviction which resulted in a prison sentence of 12 months or more as a result of a single offence. So um, it doesn't relate to an aggregate sentence or consecutive sentences. Um, they have to refer where an applicant in the last three years received three or more convictions uh, including convictions that haven't necessarily resulted in a non custodial sentence unless they've lived in the UK for five years or more. So somebody who's lived in the, five, in the UK for five years or more, it doesn't matter that they've had three or more convictions. Um, uh, they won't be referred to immigration enforcement, obviously, unless one of their convictions um, 
uh, in the last five years re resulted in imprisonment or um, whenever they received their conviction if it resulted in an imprisonment of, of 12 months or more. Um, the cases of interest to criminal casework in respect of deportation or exclusion. So uh, as an example where um, the applicant might be in prison and the case is awaiting deportation as a direction. Uh, where the applicant has entered or attempted to enter uh, into a sham marriage, uh, or civil partnership or durable partnership of convenience, where they've uh, again fraudulently attempted to obtain a right to reside under the regs, under the 2016 regs, or where um, the applicants participated in conduct that has resulted in them being deprived of British citizenship. Um, and then uh, for conduct committed after the 31st of December, uh, an applicant could be referred to immigration enforcement where um, they've committed a serious harm offence, uh, which resulted in a non-custodial sentence. So again, you'll see from uh, the slides um, that uh, the deadline for much of the consideration of um, when somebody's conduct is going to fall within kind of EU law or UK domestic immigration law, uh, what the test might be, um, harsher or um, a lesser test, um, that all relates to um, this kind of cutoff point for the 31st December 2020. Um, so uh, there's no definition of serious harm offence, but there is a case called Mahmoud, um, which is in the context of the uh, uh, 2002 Nationality Immigration Asylum Act, um, which said that what matters is the actual harm caused by the particular offence, and that there is no general and all-embracing test of seriousness. Um, but um, you could be almost guaranteed that for conduct committed after the 31st of December, um, uh, the Home Office will seek in almost all cases to argue that um, uh, the person's committed a serious harm offence, uh, even if it's not resulted in a non-custodial sentence. Uh, overseas criminality, again, we've been through that really. Um, uh, they're subject to the same, uh, in the same manner as UK convictions and they're subject to the same test referral. Um, a case isn't going to be referred to immigration enforcement when, as we've discussed, uh, there's been a recorded decision not to pursue deportation or deportation or exclusion or to be revoked, and the applicant has not committed any further offences that would meet the referral criteria. So obviously if somebody's had a deportation order pursued, they've won their appeal and then they've committed a further offence, and if that offence meets the referral criteria, the fact that they've um, they've won a previous deport appeal, doesn't matter. The case can then obviously still be referred to immigration enforcement. A uh, case isn't going to be referred to immigration enforcement where there's been a previous decision to deport, and that was, again, overturned on appeal, and the Home Office hasn't appealed that decision. Again, that's subject to the same idea that um, the applicant hasn't committed any further offences since that decision. Um, and uh, the applicant received a custodial sentence and at the time was in prison. And essentially, the Home Office didn't then pursue um, uh, a deportation referral. Um, and the applicant has, again, committed any further offences that met referral criteria. Um, so uh, this is just a change of circumstances. Um, so um, um, where... Uh, the applicant was under the age of 18 at the time of sentencing. The decision was not made to pursue deportation. Um, the reason why the Home Office doesn't pursue a deportation against somebody under the age of 18 years is that they always have to show imperative grounds, uh, which is a, a highest threshold test you can um, get. Uh, it's very difficult to meet. So therefore, what the Home Office does is where somebody is in uh, prison uh, under the age of 18 years, they wait till they get to 18 and then they serve them with a deport order. Um, and they're then able, obviously able to then refer to immigration enforcement. Um, and then there's um, a, a various test around um, the fact that uh, at the time they decided not to pursue deportation because um, the applicant came there British and it's now been proved that either they weren't, they weren't entitled to British citizenship or in very limited circumstances, obviously, um, their British citizenship has been removed. Uh, pending prosecutions. Um, so the definition of pending prosecution is defined as where somebody's been arrested or summoned in respect of one or more criminal offences and these have not yet been disposed of either by the police or the courts or where there is still a live investigation into um, whether or not somebody is to be charged. 
Um, importantly, where the applicant has a pending prosecution which doesn't meet the criteria for referral to immigration enforcement, then the Home Office has to consider whether or not it's reasonable and proportionate for the application to be paused until the outcome of the prosecution is known. It's therefore not appropriate to pause in all cases. Um, but otherwise, the application is going to be paused until the outcome of the prosecution is known. So if paused, uh, the UK Visitors Immigration uh, Department will only review the application um, six months after it's been paused. Uh, and if the outcome of the pending prosecution is known, uh, then the application will then be considered under the USSS. Um, and uh, it's quite a detailed slide, but essentially, uh, applications are going to be paused for at least six months. Sorry, applications that have been paused for at least six months must be progressed uh, when um, the following conditions are met. So there is only one pending prosecution. The maximum potential sentence upon conviction is less than 12 months, uh, according to the maximum category one sentence in line with the Sentencing Council guidance, guidelines for the NHS offence. So basically, the Sentencing Council guidelines set out. Um, what the maximum potential sentences are for each sentence, uh, for each um, charge if convicted. And obviously, if those guidelines say that the maximum sentence is less than 12 months, um, then um, that meets that particular part of the test and find out that there are no previous convictions. So all of those three have to be met um, in order for uh, applications um, after six months to be progressed. Uh, and then um, uh, we've just covered that slide already. So, um, and then just to quickly appealing um, decisions. So um, uh, there's various rights of appeal. Um, it gets a decision to refuse um, uh, on the application of eligibility suitability grounds. Uh, you can uh, appeal to a first tier tribunal um, and you can appeal on the grounds that either it breaches a right that they have under the withdrawal agreement or uh, another citizen's rights agreement uh, and or that it wasn't in accordance with the immigration rule under which it was made. Um, but probably people should seek um, legal advice uh, in relation to uh, any appeals. Right, okay, so uh, we've got a little bit of time or any questions, if anybody's got any questions, then just stop the share. Uh, sorry, I've seen that. Um, and yes, uh, the slides are gonna be available and the recording will be available as well. Um, you can either put the question in the chat box or just unmute yourself and ask it, that's absolutely fine. There's no requirement to ask questions, by the way. Um, I just have a question regarding the pending prosecutions. So yeah. I work with quite a lot of clients who have outstanding, like an outstanding, pros uh, like a pen a, have a pending prosecution, sometimes for one offence, sometimes for multiple. Yeah. Um, in terms of if you like a mechanism for uh kind of approaching the home office on on that issue of yeah is it proportionate for them to pause the application for such a significant period of time is there some kind of like mechanism or kind of right that you can kind of draw upon to address that yeah so you'd make um essentially you just make submissions to the to the um eu resolution center um, obviously quoting the UAN number, um, they can be made um, uh, online as well. And um, yeah, they're just detailed representations really around why, um, uh, irrespective of the fact that the, uh, the prosecution is still outstanding, uh, why that shouldn't um, hold up the, um, the decision. I mean, one of the things I would say about pending prosecutions is that, I mean, you can you can ask for um, for uh, the um, delay in the application to be kind of removed straight away. I mean, the, the only issue the only issue in relation to the pending prosecutions guidance is the fact that they've introduced it in relation to to when they have to progress a case. 
Um, so where there's only one pending prosecution, as I said, where uh, the maximum sentence is going to be less than 12 months and there aren't any previous convictions. But at any stage in the process, you can make representations and argue that despite the fact that there is a pending prosecution, that the uh, even if they were found um, guilty of the offence, that that is not going to lead to um, uh, their referral by immigration um, to immigration enforcement, and it's not going to lead to um, a decision being made on public policy, security, or health grounds that they should be removed. So, you know, if you've got somebody who's who's got a charge, you know, who's or who's got a live investigation by the police around, you know, you know, you know, theft of something minor, and the Home Office have just have just um, have just stayed their application, it's well, well within uh, the representative's rights. And, and all the applicants' rights to argue that there's absolutely zero point in, in, in saying their application, because even if they were convicted of the offence some way down the line, that's not going to result in them being refused on suitability grounds. So when we're okay. talking about yeah, yeah, prosecution, yeah. We're, we're talking about, in, in essence, where, where the Home Office have to do something. Yeah. But the reality yeah. is that the Home Office have a discretion um, to... to, to um, uh, to get on and make a decision in in all cases where there are, there is a live uh, uh, live investigation or a, a pending prosecution. Okay, yeah, no, that's really helpful. I just because I've I've had clients previously um, where I have tried to um, outline that to the Home Office to the EU Resolution Centre over the phone, but I haven't submitted written representations for that yeah it's yeah you, it, because yeah, it's, much better, much better, it's much better to do it in writing um yeah. uh just because you know you'll then have a have a record of it and obviously then if it then goes to six months and nothing's happened yeah you're, you're in a much better position to then be able to say well actually you know. yeah because we've, we've we've had situations where a client has been because i work for a homeless charity we have we've had clients in the past where they've had a say a shoplifting offense so yeah, relatively exactly, minor exactly. offense which exactly. has had I mean, the, the six months hold slapped on it and then it's not until five months yeah. down the line where we've got confirmation from the police national computer no, exactly. I mean, in that, disposed on of like, correctly. On, definitely on something like a shoplifting offense especially you know the, you know what the key is to look at the criteria for when immigration enforcement when there's going to be a referral yes so if, yeah. if they you know if they've got they've just got some minor shoplifting offences and they've, for instance, been in the UK for over five years. Yeah. And that's all they've got, even if they've got three or more of them and there's another yeah. investigation in relation to the shoplifting offence, you know, it is it is certainly worthwhile making representations and arguing that irrespective of, of a conviction in relation to that, um, that they're not, they don't meet the criteria. Yeah. Um, so they're not and, going to be and to, to, and to And to quote the, criteria, the criteria from yeah, the absolutely. guidance as yeah, well. Yeah, to, to say, you know, um, you know, this, you know, this person is not going to be subject to immigration enforcement. They're not going to be subject to removal deportation. Therefore, um, you know, What's you should just deal with, you, you, yeah, you yeah. should just literally deal with their, their suitability on the basis of of um, their disclosed criminal convictions and the fact that, you know, they've got this outstanding criminal conviction. Okay. Yeah, no, that's really helpful. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much for uh, attending. Sorry, I was a bit late getting started. And thank you for your persistence with my slideshow, uh, which gets on having to be restarted. Um, but great. Thank you very much. And as I said, the slides and the recording will all be available um, on the website. So, uh, and um, Centre Point Project as well. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.